So this session is going to be a detailed session on Zoho Catalyst, our new developer offering from Zoho. Uh, before I start, I want to um, touch through some common problems that we as developers face. Uh, to start off with, uh, let's imagine someone uploads an image from their mobile app or their web app onto a server and you'd want to you know, create thumbnail images. Uh, this is a very common use case if you're building a social networking application. A couple of other uh, use cases like migrating data from one CRM to another or scanning through some log files on your server to find unusual activities. Let's take the first one for example and throughout this talk we will be using Foodgram, a mock application which is Instagram for food where people create their profiles and post photos about their favorite food. So you can see the rock over there posting about his favorite noodles. So we'll be using this app to you know, uh, get in detail about uh, certain aspects that you do in a, de a general development environment. So coming back to our uh, problem, generating thumbnail images is a very common problem in social networking gaps. Take Foodgram for example. Uh, whenever the user uploads a profile image, which is of size, which is of a large size, uh, both in terms of dimensions and uh, you know the megabytes that takes it to store data, you'd want to shrink it to a smaller image so that you show it uh, in your application, say for comments or something like that. Let's see what it takes to actually do this. Uh, in plain sight, this might seem like a really simple problem because you get an image, you resize it, put it in a server. Take, take this thumbnail image, store it somewhere. But in reality, that is not the case. Anyone who has done some backend would know that you need to provision machines to capture these image, image uploads from whenever you get it from a mobile or web app and then enqueue these images onto a queue so that you can process these images uh, with your own custom logic for image manipulation or shrinking them. And then comes the tough part, deploying each of these uh, separate entities onto the server and onto the cloud. But this is just day one. Moving forward, you will want to scale your servers, monitor your servers, and log these servers, and also take care of patching the latest security updates and OS updates. At this point, you have already moved from development to DevOps. And you can see that uh, the only thing you had to do for this simple uh, problem, which was generating thumbnail, was just focus on the business logic of doing the thumbnail images and not, and not all these. So we believe that there has to be a simpler solution for this. And which is why we introduced Catalyst, a serverless development environment that gives you the reliability of Zoho's infrastructure. We'll see how these words uh, come together. Uh, so this is what we'll be discussing in uh, throughout the day. So we'll talk about what serverless is and briefly touch upon the serverless evolution. We'll see how Zoho has evolved to what it is today from a technology perspective. So we'll be seeing Zoho's evolution from a tech perspective. We'll be looking at functions, which is one of the building blocks when you create a serverless application, and look at some common use cases on how you will be using Catalyst, and we'll look at the benefits of using Catalyst. To start off, what is serverless? Serverless does not mean that there are no servers, but it is that we abstract servers to the point that you don't have to worry about them meaning that you only concentrate on the development part and not the DevOps part of doing your job. Let's see how we have come to this point over the years. So yeah, long back we have uh, on-premise service, which I believe some of us still do, uh, which is basically renting out physical space and having machines over there so that they can serve your applications. This is a very tedious process because in case you want to scale up your service, you need more physical space and you need more physical machines. But from there, we have come a long way. We have moved to hosting, where we needn't you know, bother about physical spaces. And we moved to the cloud computing era, where infrastructure and platform was given out as a service. Here we are at serverless, uh, which breaks down any application into two parts, which is storage and compute. And we give it as a service. So the things you see there, FAS and BAS, they are functions as a service, and database backend as a service. So essentially, any app would have these two components, that is a backend and a compute, where backend takes care of all your data and compute takes care of all your logic. We'll see how this impacted Zoho 
to evolve into what it is today. Zoha has been releasing 40 products over the last 14 years. This means that we have been you know, deploying three new products every year with new updates and features. How do we do this and how is this even possible? The secret sauce lies in our architecture. We run our own service and this is how it looks like. So at the bottom, as I said, we have storage and compute. Storage takes care of database servers, file servers, cache and messaging queues. Compute takes care of all the app servers where our business logic resides. App servers can have uh, multiple applications that are running Java, JS, Python, or anything. And we have separate servers that could serve these uh, application servers like Tomcat, Node, or Rails, or whatever. On top of this, we have some reusable components that is common for every single Zoho app. Uh, take, for example, authentication. You see authentication in every single Zoho app and this is done as a separate module so that it is self-sustained and anything that goes into, th into this authentication component is um, autonomous of every other Zoho app. We also have other components like mail servers, notifications, security, and a lot more. So on top of these two, we build applications like web apps, mobile apps, and SDKs. Can you see where this is leading us to? So we are opening up our infrastructure for you to use so that you can build applications on scale without needing to worry about maintaining servers. Catalyst exactly helps you with that. So let's see how Catalyst transforms Zoho's architecture for you to use uh, by giving you each of them as a service. So what we saw earlier, storage and compute, we are giving them as a service, backend as a service and function as a service. Uh, we give data store, file store, cache and messaging queues in storage part and we give you functions and app logic on the compute part. More on that later. We also give you our components, which are basically user authentication, mail, notifications, and all that as reusable components that every of your app needs so that you don't have to do this on your own. On top of this, you can build web apps, mobile apps, and microservices, basically anything serverless on top of this. Let's look back at our problem and see how we can solve this with Catalyst. We'll get an image from a REST API or from one of our SDKs, and we put this onto our file, server, file store. We'll probably create a folder in our file store and put it over there. Meanwhile, we'll also put this in the queue and a function, we'll write a function where our business logic resides. Basically, we write code to you know, resize the image. And from this queue, we can consume the image from the queue and we can store the thumbnail into the file store. Uh, as you can see, uh, you only have to bother on writing the functions and not anything else because everything else is already set up for you in Catalyst. You just have, for example, in file store, you just have to right click and you know create a folder and not provision a server to you to like store files and scale up and all that. So as you can already see, you only have to concentrate on writing the business logic, in this case, resizing the image. I want to drill deep on how functions work as this is one of the main building blocks of a serverless application. With functions, functions is basically where you write code, which means that you can bring your own code, meaning you don't have to learn a new language to deploy your apps in Catalyst. You can use this, the languages that you use right now to deploy function onto Catalyst. That is a big deal, actually. We support Node.js right now uh, because we feel that JavaScript is the most used language right now. Uh, going further, we'll be supporting Java and Python and any other um, you know, uh, program language that we see fit. This also means that you can bring in your third-party libraries. This is a powerhouse because you don't have to rewrite all the uh, common stuff that's already been written. So, for example, in Node.js, all the NPM modules that are out there in the world is automatically in use for you when you deploy it on Catalyst. You can also use your favorite code editor, which means that this gives you a truly offline experience. Or if you feel that you want to do code on our website, we also give you a powerful online code editor. This is all backed up by a very strong command line interface tools, which gives you a truly native and uh, offline experience to do local debugging and instant deployment. We have commands that instantly you know, lets you debug and deploy onto the servers. This brings us to sandboxing environments. So first you'd want to code in your local machine 
and test it out. And then you deploy using Catalyst Deploy to a developer sandbox so that you can, your team can see how your app works. Once you're satisfied with that, you'd want to put this on a staging platform where you'd want your stakeholders to see how this app looks and feels. And once they are satisfied, you can push it to production. So as you can see, developer, team, stakeholders, and world. So this is by default supported in Catalyst as you can have multiple environments to deploy multiple versions of your application. Let's go through some practical use cases on how we see that you'll be using Catalyst. One of this is what we already talked about, building REST APIs. We see that you'll also be doing processing large amount of data. You can also run scheduled tasks and of course build fully customizable serverless applications. We'll drill deep into each of these. Building REST APIs. REST APIs are the standard these days if you want to have interoperability between services. Let's go back to our Foodgram app and see what we can do with it. I would need two REST API endpoints, for example, to upload an image and to display comments so that applications such as Facebook or even a creator app so can push data onto my Foodgram app. How would I do this? I'll create a REST API endpoint in the app logic part that we talked about in functions as a service and expose this to clients such as mobile, web, or even a creator app and store the data back in our data store and file store. So what else can you do with REST APIs? You can do common tasks such as creating REST APIs to serve Sigma extensions, serving creator apps, and general, general interoperability stuff like exposing APIs to third-party applications like Facebook or Twitter, building data processing pipelines. One of the things I would need in my Foodgram app is people get notorious these days, and I would want to flag these um, offensive comments that you know get into my system. So what I want to do is I want to flag offensive comments, I want to flag offensive images, and I also want to do some sentiment analysis on my comments. How can I do this? It's very simple. I already have my data in my data store. I'll just put all those comments in a queue and write a custom function that has a custom logic to it. I can also use Zia, our ML offering, to find out sentiment analysis or any RACI or NSFW images and store this metadata into my database. Here are some more common tasks that you would do uh, in this aspect. You can migrate data from one system to another. Say you want to migrate a contacts from an Excel sheet to a CRM you can put the whole of Excel sheet onto a database. And from there, you can write a custom function that serves up and hosts it in the next CRM. You can scan for log files to find interesting events. You can have anomaly detection and prediction analysis from our ML offering and run this uh, on your log files to find interesting events. You can analyze data streams and you can also clean your database. So the logical um, extension to this would be scheduling this to run every month or every year or however you see fit. In my case, I want to run the offensive comment filtering every day so that I can mail these uh, users that they are crossing a threshold. So what I do is I create a scheduler, I scan the database and do the same function and mail these users. As you can see, we give you so many things out of the box so that, so that you don't have to do them by yourselves. For example, create the scheduler. It's only a click of button away to create a scheduler. Here are some ways you can build scheduling jobs to do certain things. You can notify inactive users through email. You can clean old files, which you know take up a lot of space in your servers. You can generate stats pre periodically if you want to like create monthly stats, weekly stats, and all that. And you can also do general stuff like cleaning up your database. Next up is creating serverless applications. You can create fully customized, fully serverless applications by giving the best possible user experience through our SDKs. We provide SDKs for the web, mobile, like iOS and Android, so that you can create fully customized user experience. Going back to the slide to show that this is a totally customized user experience that we created uh, just having data in the catalyst and writing our own uh, UI part. So this is something you might want to do for some of your applications if you see it.
So that's the SD case. Let's go on to the benefits. As you can see, there is zero server maintenance because, well, there are no servers for you to manage. We take care of patching, logging, provisioning, and updating all the servers so that you don't have to worry about this. We take care of elastic scaling. So the thing is, let's take Foodgram for example. So I do this application and I put it on the App Store. And today, five, five people use my application. So I just have to provision my servers for five people if I had to like run my server on my own. But then tomorrow, 5,000 people come because Dwayne The Rock Johnson is using my app. And what do I have to do in a normal use case scenario? I have to call the hosting guys and say that I need these many servers. Or you know, if I'm in the cloud, I have to like scale my servers to, and I have to pay for that. And suddenly, next month, these users drop because they lose interest in the app. I'll be still paying for those 5,000 people, even though they are not here. So elastic scaling takes care of, you know, the thing is, you don't have to worry about scaling. We take care of that. And you only pay for what your customers use. So if you get 5,000 requests a day, you only pay for those 5,000 requests. And if you get zero requests a day, you don't pay for that. So basically, you don't pay for idle time. Like every other Zoho app, we deeply care about your security and privacy. This is a part of our culture and it's a part of our infrastructure. So that comes automatically to your applications. Let's look at how Catalyst looks like. This is the screenshot of the app. And you can see all the components uh, that we discussed about on the left-hand side menu so that it is only a click away. Uh, note that the only part you have to concentrate is modeling your database and writing your logic in the functions. So, and everything else is taken care of by Catalyst. So in simple terms, you can use Catalyst to create highly scalable, highly reliable, highly secure applications that runs on top of Zoho's infrastructure. 